Greer is given a platform to speak for an hour, which is an hour longer than any of her critics. She is given an armed guard, a privilege not afforded to the trans people whose lives she puts at risk. This is not a free speech, uh, a free speech scenario because the manipulations that have happened to allow Greer to speak is a mark of massive social capital that only a very, very few people have in our society. The odds are so twisted massively in Greer's favour. So, I mean, this brings us to the issue of why we'd want to stop Greer from speaking in the first place. Well, I mean, quite simply, her words take away the personhood of trans people. She literally denies the right for trans people to exist on their own terms. It should be clear that in a democratic society, speech can never be totally free, that your liberty exists contingent on your liberty not infringing on that of others. Our laws against defamation, libel, and hate speech attest to the limits that have to be, called, uh, that have to be placed on a fundamental freedom for society fu to function in a, dem in a democratic manner. It has to be pointed out also that the right to free speech refers only to freedom from prosecution. So it doesn't give you the right to force your ideas onto others, and it doesn't give you the right to be listened to by anyone. In other words, the right to free speech is not equitable to the right to a platform. When a prominent figure says hateful and bigoted things and refuses to apologise or even entertain the possibility that she might be wrong, as in Greer's case, it is common sense that there should be consequences. Two things for me become evident from this. The first is that if the argument against no platforming runs on the basis that no platforming is a threat to freedom of speech, it should be noted that as a society we believe that free speech should be tempered by the harm principle. In other words, the right to freedom from harm outweighs the freedom of speech. No platforming as a tool would thereby be legitimated if we believe that the harm caused by a potential speaker outweighs their right to speak. It is vital to note that our judgment of this, both of harm and of the threshold of harm that, um, like that would require no platforming, is inherently political. Again, there is no neutral platform from which to judge this. Um, we have to make a value judgment as to what we consider harmful and what we as a society uh, deem that we should be, that should be protected. Um, secondly, it needs to be made clear that no platforming is not foremost or only a free speech issue. No platforming is not an attempt to prevent these ideas from being stated, it is an attempt to prevent these ideas from gaining traction or being validated. This is important if we believe that the violation of free speech right constitutes no platforming as illegitimate. A platform is not a neutral position, it is an elevation. It is an invitation to be heard, implying that there is a value in what is said. A platform is inherently embedded within the power structures of institutions and invests the speaker with performative power. It is not and cannot be a politically neutral position, and who we choose to elevate speaks to who holds power and which ideas are powerful. This is clear when we look at no platforming in practice, which is always against people who lead the subordination of a group of oppressed people. You have a situation where people are subordinated, and you want to double the harm by providing their oppressors with a platform which provides them with more social capital. What I've tried to emphasize is that to fit the ideal epithet scenario of free speech onto an unfree world is damaging because if you don't recognize the power inequalities at play, you will continue to replicate them. The freedom to dissent and offend the powerful is not of the same value or standing as, uh, as the freedom to attack the disenfranchised and disempowered. When we want to no platform fascists such as Marine Le Pen, what we're trying to take away is her privilege to be racist in order that black, brown and queer bodies can have the right to exist without violence. To frame this as an infringement of rights is completely disingenuous because an analogy would be the attitude of some white people during the civil rights movement in America. Um, where whites complain that if black people got more rights, this would encroach on their rights. It is, a f it is therefore false to equate the loss of privilege as a harm. So I would then argue that no platforming can be seen as a democratic intervention in the power structures to enable those who are oppressed to greater say what kind of values that we as a society want to hold and to legitimate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chi-Chi. Could you hear at the back? You could. That's great. Can I suggest we turn off the light? So can, can I suggest we turn off the searchlight, if at all possible? Um, because then the speaker... You would prefer to sit. OK, Monica would prefer to sit. So people can hear. OK, if we could try to keep to the five minutes, if at all possible, yes. that would be great. So everyone, no one has no platformed in this room. <laughs> Monica. 
So a major challenge faced today by those who dare express concern about the growing frequency of no platforming at universities is that their arguments are often interpreted as uncharitably as possible, if not outright misrepresented. They are lambasted by the proponents of these limits for failing to acknowledge the harm or offense that free speech can cause, particularly to marginalized groups. Allow me, therefore, to provide a few disclaimers on behalf of myself as well as my colleagues that will hopefully ensure we do not suffer the same fate here today. First of all, we are not advocating an absolutist approach to free speech. This is clearly an untenable position, as the rightful bans on child pornography, perjury, extortion, and so on clearly illustrate. We acknowledge that speech can cause harm, and that in some cases, no platforming can indeed be a means of mitigating such harm. Rather, the questions that we ask here today are, what is the nature of this harm, and how should we respond to it whilst simultaneously striving to uphold free speech? I argue that no platforming as currently practiced is not a legitimate tool of activism for two reasons. First, because it fails to differentiate between cases of genuine harm and those of trivial offense or discomfort. And second, that in failing to make this distinction, no platforming actually stimmies social justice. When the no platform principle emerged in the 1970s, it was explicitly restricted to racist and fascist speech, with harm clearly defined as incitement to rac racial hatred or to violence. The problem with no platform today is the lack of such a definition of harm. What we see instead is the justification of no platforming on the basis of a variety of complaints, including feeling uncomfortable or offended or threatened. These complaints do not constitute harm in the same tangible way as, for instance, incitement to violence. Rather, they are claims of purely subjective experience. And this premise is central to the contemporary politics of identity. Subjective experience, the argument goes, is by definition is exclusive it is unknowable to those who do not have the relevant identity characteristic. The subjective experience of womanhood, for example, is unknowable to any man. That of being black is unknowable to anyone white. Accordingly, the subjective offense or harm claimed by a particular identity group cannot be doubted or called into question by any other group for lack of that experience. By this logic, then, all claims of subjective experience must necessarily be considered equally valid. You see how this becomes easily exploitable. If no platforming can be justified exclusively on the basis of a given group's subjective experience, we have no means of ensuring that petty cases that are based on minor discomfort or even mere disagreement with some speech, yet are cloaked in the language of offense or harm, are not allowed to pass. This is problematic because we have no way of adjudicating between requests for no platform, since we lack an objective measure for determining which ought to be upheld and which ought not. Eugene Volokh, a law professor, um, calls this, uh, this problem censorship envy, an initial request by a given identity group to censor some speech on the basis of claimed harm prompts analogous requests from other identity groups. This leads to a very slippery slope. Once we allow some speech bans due to claimed harm, we cannot justifiably deny other requests made on the same ground since, again, given the unknowability of subjective experience, all claims of harm must be treated as equal. Inevitably, at some point, these claims will come into conflict. And we are already seeing this, for example, with the controversy surrounding Julie Bindle. Bindle is a trans-exclusionary feminist and has been no platform by the NUS on grounds of transphobia. But how can this decision be reconciled with the equally valid claims of trans-exclusionary feminists that womanhood is contingent upon being biologically female? These feminists can likewise legitimately request to no platform trans-inclusive viewpoints. This leaves us at a stalemate. We have no means of arbitrating between requests for censorship when these requests are made exclusively on the basis of subjective experience informed by discrete identity characteristics. In a pluralistic society, justice requires that we balance the competing interests of different groups in the fairest way possible. To this end, we have to expect that our positions can be made comprehensible to others and that we can persuade them that our interests should be collectively acted upon. To the extent that no platforming forcibly subordinates the interests of society to one group's subjective interest, without providing a means for determining whether that subordination is in fact just, no platforming is fundamentally divorced from social justice. That is why it is an illegitimate tool of activism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica, and also for keeping brilliantly inside time. Um, obviously, please do pick up on points that the other side has made in your five minutes. Uh, and if you, if you feel like standing up, you will not now be blinded. So 
so it might, I, I, if you feel like it, but don't feel the necessity. Sizwe, I think you're next. No, I am. Oh, it's Damien, okay. Damien, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, you'll hear from Sizwe in a minute, don't worry. Um, so Julian Blanc uh, is a man who makes his living giving talks in which he uh, encourages men and gives them practical tips about how they can uh, be violent towards women. He tells them how they can sexually abuse, rape, uh, and strangle women. And when he wanted to come into the UK to give these talks, Theresa May banned him from coming. We think she was right to ban him from coming. But crucially, because you just heard from the other side that they're in favour of legal restrictions on speech, Crucially, we think that if Theresa May hadn't banned him and the Oxford Union or free speech debate had decided to host him, then we should advocate for his no platform. That is to say, we don't believe, that, unlike uh, the other side, as you just heard, we don't believe that uh, whether or not people should be uh, stopped from speaking should be entirely contingent on the decisions that a government happens to take. We have our own moral standards. I, I want to come on to talk about uh, why, although we think speech acts aren't sacrosanct and, and shouldn't be free from the kind of regulation that governs other acts, why actually there's a slightly lower bar for regulating acts in the case of uh, no platforming, why it's not simply a case of free speech, and the free speech discourse is a bit disingenuous there. But first I just want to respond to what we've heard, what we've just heard. What you just heard was, by its own admission, a phrase that was just used, a slippery slope argument, right? So you heard that if we start no platforming, say, racist and fascist, then we might end up no platforming anyone, and that would be awful. And indeed, it is awful that lots of people, we were told, are no platform who shouldn't be. Now, look at the text of the motion today. We're asked whether it is legitimate for activists to no platform people. We're not asked whether everyone who has ever been no-platformed should have been no-platformed, yeah. and we are not obliged to defend everyone who has ever been no-platformed, so bear that in mind. But more, I mean, it was a logical fallacy, but beyond that, beyond that, just think about an analogous case. Think about the case of prison. Right? Imagine someone stands up and says, look, if we start imprisoning people, we might imprison innocent people. Governments might make bad laws, and so imprison people who shouldn't be imprisoned. We can accept all those things, but we can still think, and lots of people do still think, that we should have a prison system because the consequences of not imprisoning people are really great. So although we agree that maybe people get no platform who shouldn't be, although we agree that Turks might demand to no platform trans people or fascists might demand to no platform Jews, we still think we should have a no platform policy because not no platforming anyone, as I gave the example of Julian Blanc advocating and telling men how to go and beat up women, not no, pla no platforming anyone uh, has a bad consequence. And, and just lastly, the whole content of that speech uh, was about uh, the problem of basing no platforming on subjective experience. That's not the only argument for no platforming. Neither Chi Chi nor Sizwe nor I are into that kind of identity politics framing. None of us think that no platforming should be about subjective experience. We think it should be about objective harms. So that's not the only argument for no platforming. Um, but to talk now about why uh, no platforming is not simply a case of free speech. So there's a difference between giving someone a platform and allowing them free speech. It's kind of like the difference between putting someone in prison for thinking something, that's denying their free speech, and not inviting them to tea because they think something. That's not giving them a platform. So to give you an example, Ronald Reagan uh, was accused of having a soft spot for Holocaust denial, and he said, no, 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 that's not the case. Whenever I have Holocaust deniers at the dinner table, I always rush to condemn them, which raises the obvious question, why on earth are you having Holocaust deniers to dinner? Right? Now, my contention here, my contention here is that you don't need to believe that Holocaust denial should be banned in order to be concerned that the President of the United States chooses to dine with Holocaust deniers. So why is there a lower bar for, for no platform? The first is that when we know platform people, we're not cutting off all their access to discourse, as you are when the state bans people. When activists know platform people in a particular space, it has a less severe effect. Secondly, there's a distinction between what you can say, freedom of speech, and what you should to say, what we should provide them with a platform to say. So the old example is someone farting in a lift. They should have the right to do so. It doesn't mean we should encourage everyone to do it. There's a difference there, right? And finally, finally, with the difference between no platform and free speech, everyone all the time, and this is crucial about the kind of hidden left-right politics in this debate, everyone no platforms people all the time. But what your side is doing in this debate is only focusing on those left-wing students who no platform people. So when the Daily Mail gives a column to Jan Moyer to say that Stephen Gately's death proves that homosexuality is a bad lifestyle choice, but has never given a column to me, the Daily Mail's no platform in me. And yet free speech debate and the Oxford Union aren't standing up in my defence. But when students try to participate in the same battle and say, if the Daily Mail, if Rupert Murdoch, with all his money and power, there isn't this equal marketplace of ideas, some people have a lot more money and power and social capital, if those people are denying platforms to some of us and giving platforms to bad people, why shouldn't we be allowed to deny platforms to bad people and give platforms to nice people instead? But the second reason, the second really puzzling thing uh, about this, this equation between no platform and free speech is that it hides the power dynamics, and Chichi spoke a bit about this, it hides the power dynamics at play in real cases of no platforming. There's this bizarre inversion, right? Free speech toleration developed as an enlightenment discourse in which the powerless demanded the right to criticise the powerful. And yet now the powerful demand their free speech, which they say is being cut off by student activists. Now, the bizarre thing about this is that we conceptualise freedom as something which we want because it allows us to do something with it. 
Right? We want the freedom to speak so that we can be heard in debates. It's an ends-based reasoning for which we want freedom. And that kind of ends-based reasoning always applies for the kinds of powerful people who we want to deny platforms to. So just to give you an example, right? when David Willits went to speak in Cambridge, the, se the minister for universities, as he was traveling tuition fees, and some students stood up and protested against his speech, the University of Cambridge expelled those students for protesting because they said they'd interfered with the free speech of a man who had infinite access to newspaper articles, to column inches, to the media, to, to, to propagate his views. And then when I was at the Oxford Union and took part in a protest against David Willits, those of us who took part in the protest were taken outside the Oxford Union, the organisation Charlie runs, uh, and one of the members of the Oxford Union had her membership taken away from her for protesting against David Willits because she was told she'd interfered with his free speech. Now ask yourself this, who more needs freedom? An ordinary student who's trying to make their voice heard, or David Willits who has infinite access to platforms to make his voice heard? And I'll just, I'll just finish with this uh, kind, of, kind of analogy. This conception of freedom, of free speech, which is entirely... Uh, doesn't consider power relations, is a bit like someone standing outside your room day and night screaming bullying abuse at you. And if you go to your college and say, please stop them bullying me, the college says, sorry, they have a right to free speech. Free speech exists, as you've been told, in a context of power relations, and we think that's very important. And so the real limitations on free speech are not those of us who seek to remove, I'll, I'll finish now, not those of us who seek to remove certain select platforms from already enormously powerful people. The real limits on free speech are state actions as part of the war on terror, as part of the prevent agenda, that genuinely deprive marginalised voices of their right to speak and stick them in prison if they do so. And we'd like to hear more about that and less concerned with student activists. Thank you very much, Bunby. Who's going next inside? Charlie. Charlie. <coughs> I'd like to start by saying that just as the proposition does need to justify every instance of no platforming, also we don't have to justify every instance of someone shutting down or someone defending free speech on certain grounds which we do not think are justified or legitimate. I think it's a really important point to start with. The second point is that I think we have to be very clear about the grounds on which we can justify no platforming. Barnaby actually put it, put it the best, I think, when it comes to the grounds for no platforming. That is the objective harms done to persons due to the wrongfulness of the views. And to bring the point that Barnaby raised of the Daily Mail, uh, the reason the Daily Mail doesn't give Barnaby Rain a column is not because it decided that the grounds, that the grounds of his views are objectively, cause objective harm and therefore wrong, but because he's not significant enough. Because no one knows who he is, and because he's not part of the, of the national discourse yet, but I'm sure that he will be in about 20 years' time when he inevitably runs for office. <laughs> now to move on, move on to, the, to the body of my point, I believe that no platform is illegitimate for two reasons. The first is that it's counterproductive, and the second is that it's incoherent. On the point of why it's counterproductive, the key question is, does in fact no platforming decrease the marginalisation of the marginalised? And in my opinion, the answer is no. The views that we consider to be wrong, to be intolerant and harmful, are exposed through public discourse. Yes, it's an obvious point, but it's one we should tease. The suppression of speech, which otherwise would be aired at platforms, leads to underground movements based on intolerance, which systematise and organise themselves before re-entering the public domain. Think of the BMP, think of the EDL. Refusing to know platform views, which we consider to be wrong, is ha actively helping to ensure the defeat of those ideas and not just the suppression of those ideas. And this is the most important point, I think, in terms of it being counterproductive. So multifaceted are the ways in which hateful views contained within an individual can be expressed and thereby cause harm to someone through being uh, discriminatory or whatever, and the precise nature of that harm is obviously up for dispute. That suppressing speech, which would be aired at platforms, does not achieve the eradication of that harm. Most discourse and human interaction, which is intolerant or discriminatory, does not take place in the public arena. The goal has to be, when engaging in these public arenas, with these platforms, to convince people that certain views they hold are incorrect, and that they therefore should not hold them. In turn, if they don't hold them, the source of the harm in question, when acting or speaking on a platform, intolerantly, is gone. Telling someone they're wrong and can't speak, end of discussion, is a really bad way of convincing people to change their mind. That's human nature. And that's probably why, generally, non-liberal uh, political movements, which begin with the assumption that their views are so self-evidently right, do not fare very well electorally. In short, no platforming is not only ineffective in the sense that it does not stop the marginalisation of the marginalised, but it's moreover counterproductive. 
because fewer people would in fact believe things we think are clearly wrong if generally able to be challenged through public discourse. The best example is Nick Griffin on Question Time. His polls went down immediately after he appeared. The second point, why is it incoherent? The purpose of free speech is through public discourse, just as Chishi put, uh, to provide public discourse with a range of ideas and by being exposed to different arguments in favour and against each idea, we can decide which views we think are right. In a sense, free speech is instrumental. The ultimate goal is working out what we think is right and wrong. It is not the inherent purpose of, uh, of free speech isn't inherently useful, it serves a purpose. It's not inherently good, it serves a purpose. The problem with no platforming is that there is no circumstance in which one can no platform and leave open the possibility that the speech in question might be right. This is the point that Barnaby put so clearly when he said it's about objective harms to do with wrongfulness, given that the harm identified is not only offence-based. It is the absolute knowledge of the wrongfulness of the speech which justifies no platforming, Also, the argument runs. If the speech in question might be right, then the onus is on the potential no platformer to demonstrate how the idea contained within the speech is wrong in their opinion in comparison to other ideas. My key question is how this absolute knowledge of the wrongfulness of the speech comes about. Ironically, this absolute belief probably came about through public discussion and deliberation. More ironically, I'd raise the question why we are here engaging in a public dialogue, unless we thought this expression of free speech might assist our understanding of whether the motion at hand is right or wrong. Quite clearly, just as Monica put, there are many instances where people think they absolutely know what is right and wrong, while holding a diametrically opposing view to another person who thinks they know absolutely what is right and wrong. This causes serious problems for no platforming, where there are multiple and different conceptions of what is definitely wrong. Further and more importantly, it's a very dangerous tool. With free speech, the power to decide what is right and wrong lies with millions of indi individual persons who make up the marketplace of idea ideas, and they are free to come to different conclusions. With no platforming, the absolute knowledge that something is wrong means that this power is transferred to the no platformers. Who are these people, from where do they gain their authority, and how are they accountable? In conclusion, no platforming is counterproductive because it does not allow the greater exposure of wrong views. No platforming is also incoherent because it presumes absolute knowledge of what, what is right and wrong, but we use free speech as a tool to discuss what ideas are right and wrong. I do, however, think that there are certain obligations placed upon anyone who has control of the platform, and I'm happy to discuss these further in questions, but these obligations require the person to discern which views are significant in terms of popular support, rather than to discern the views that are definitely wrong. I think this is the crux of the obligation upon anyone who has control over a, 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 um, a, a platform. Uh, in short, liberalism can be scary. It can allow circumstances in which the majority hold views which I think are really, really wrong. The alternative, of which no platforming is a part, means that the people who consider themselves to be the philosopher kings with special access to objective truths decide what views can be discussed by the common person, despite those philosopher kings being unelected and unaccountable. Let people decide for themselves through reason and logic and reject the notion that the intelligentsia should decide for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Sit away. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Some quite astonishing and startling things I think we've already heard from the side of the house this evening. Um, what I'm going to do is really try to respond to much of the substantive matter that's come from this side of the house and to clarify a number of misconceptions and myths that I think have been propagated in this debate so far about what our position entails and what burdens it imposes on people who will ultimately, when they leave this room, agree with us tonight. <laughs> now, the first thing we need to just get clear before we move into any direct rebuttal is that the right to speak is not to be equated with the right to a public platform. And on many occasions already in this debate, this side of the house has equated those two things. The right to a platform is a special benefit and a special form of protected speech that therefore the bars and barriers to attainment thereof are greater than simply the, the ability to speak with someone next to you on a train, for example. A platform is different to the right to speak. But moreover, the right to speak doesn't equate to the duty to needlessly offend either. And there are complete, complete and very clear cases 
in which one can still speak without needlessly offending, and one should do that. And Barnaby's brilliant case of Mehdi Hassan is, is excellent. In fact, what he went on to say is that we shouldn't fart along in solidarity in the lifts with those people either. And this is often what people seem to be suggesting that we do. And finally, just in terms, and by way of clarification, what we are not arguing <coughs> this evening is that every controversial speaker deserves to be no platform. And you don't have to agree with that to agree with us this evening. We're also not arguing that our position is necessarily in contradistinction with free speech. What this debate is essentially about is one of free speech absolutism versus a rather high bar for sp free speech with certain limits. And that's really the, those are the parameters of today's debate and any attempt by this side of the house to confuse that is misguided. But what I want to say in terms of direct response to this side of the house is firstly that it's interesting that they do make these distinctions and then they run away and they say, well, the incitement of violence is of course nothing that we would like, but then they don't give us any analysis as to in boundary cases where incitement of violence isn't exactly clear what they would do about that. So we see that they've made those arguments and we see that they've made exceptions, but they haven't told us how, when, and why those exceptions are made. And we find that curious, ladies and gentlemen. But the further point is that what we would argue is that in crucial circumstances, and this is key, ladies and gentlemen, no platforming actually expands the frontiers of contestation and speech. Because clearly, ladies and gentlemen, the mere act of elocution cannot be reduced to the right of free speech. What's important when we contest ideas, when we debate, is the way agendas are set, is the way that assumptions are made, is the way that rooms are created, is the way that people are given time to speech. And clearly, in, in terms of speaking about power relations, the level at which we set the agenda is often a form of uncontestable speech. And we would argue that contesting speech at the root of the level of agenda setting not only combats problematic forms of fascism and racism, which is a kind of nice byproduct, but it also enhances the, the, the true and the fundamental act of contestation in democratic societies. So this notion that we prevent illocution doesn't necessarily always mean that we prevent expression or that we prevent speech. And in fact, it often creates better debates, ladies and gentlemen, because now we are having debates about transphobia. And now when Rhodes Must Fall says Rhodes should be no platform because there is no right to posthumous veneration, people are talking about the legacy of Rhodes and we're actually having a more enriched discussion. So the notion that we contest speech at the root of agenda setting should not be confused with the notion that we are against speech per se. But finally, ladies and gentlemen, we hear from this side of the house that there's just no way to adjudicate. You know, racists are racist, but hey, these other guys might not be racist, so it's all subjective and we put our hands up in the air. What nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. The fact of the matter is that we live in a social context. I mean, I don't want to have to bring out the data here on, uh, you know, just this last year, uh, the questions of anti-Semitism in the, in the European Union, what Eurobarometer has said about how many instances of racial hate speech have been uh, uh, directed at vulnerable groups. Ladies and gentlemen, power relations are surely one way of adjudicating. If a group hasn't been allowed into Oxford until 1938, they've been systematically low, no platform for 400 years. On what basis do you stand up and say that, oh, your subjective experience as a black person is kind of weighed the same as a bespectacled, balding, besuited white man? We can adjudicate, ladies and gentlemen. That's ridiculous. But also, ladies and gentlemen, this invisible hand notion that somehow we're going to reach this ejaculatory uh, million utopia where all arguments converge on the truth is also patent nonsense because if certain people are, no, are platformed and are privileged and their ideas continue to be propagated and society and material conditions fundamentally exclude people, then in what market does the truth win out by some magic bullet? And ladies and gentlemen, we think for these reasons, we are both on the side of free speech and we are on the side of justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sizwe. I don't know what John Stuart Mill would have thought as having his, of having his great idea of free speech described as an ejaculatory <laughs> utopia. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, he's not here to tell us. We know who he thought shouldn't have spoken. Exactly. Damien. The uneducated masses. Uh, I'll certify that. Please okay. do. Um, Please do. So uh, Sizwe sort of stole my idea in that I did also decide it's probably a good idea to respond to some of the arguments put by the other side. 
Now, I think Chi Chi, is it? Sorry, have I got your name right there? Yeah. Yeah, um, Chi Chi made a very good point, which was that uh, not all messages are propagated from an equal power base. Uh, I agree with that, actually. Um, somebody who's given the platform of a newspaper is obviously in a more powerful position than somebody who just publishes a leaflet and hands it out. So it's not true to say that all platforms are equal. Mm. But where I disagree with her, and for reasons that I'm going to come to, is to say that to provide a platform is to legitimize. I think that's where she's fundamentally wrong, and I'll, I'll cite an example shortly as to why I think that. Now, Barnaby drew some interesting parallels. Uh, he mentioned Theresa May banning Julian Blanc from entering the UK. Now, I need to point out a slight difference between Theresa May and an activist with a megaphone. Uh, Theresa May is accountable to Parliament. Uh, she is subject to the rule of law. Every single decision she makes can be judicially reviewed in a court. Every single one of them can be questioned. If I don't like her, I can vote for somebody different. With the greatest respect, I can't do that with Barnaby. Uh, so there's a fundamental difference there between a politician and a private individual seeking to impose their views upon me. I don't think it's quite true to say that those two are analogous in any way. Equally, uh, he drew an example of saying, well, we will occasionally get people in prison wrong but that's not a very good argument for getting rid of a prison system. Well, actually, that's, I agree with that sentiment. However, prison, again, is subject to democratic control. It's subject to norms of law. It's subject to evidential burdens. There's a painstaking search for truth, and ultimately, you have to convince an impartial jury of peers that somebody is guilty or not guilty. That's something, again, Barnaby fails to take into account. He doesn't go to a jury for permission before he decides to tell other students at Oxford who they should and should not be listening to fundamentally different to a prison system. Now, one thing I did agree with Barnaby on is that somebody like Rupert Murdoch has a kind of an inverse power to the power that somebody who was seeking to know a platform would have. So he can decide who gets a platform and who doesn't from a position of editorial control. That I agree with, and I think that's equally open to abuse as would be an activist no platforming in Oxford. The only thing I can say is, I can choose not to purchase the Times, if I so wish, but I can't really do much about Barnaby storming the gates of the Oxford Union with his megaphone, trying to bash down the door, stopping Marine Le Pen from speaking. So the two, again, not quite analogous at all. Now, there are two examples I really want to cite here. Uh, the first is of a man called Arthur Redfern. Now, Arthur Redfern was a minibus driver based in Bradford, and he was employed by Bradford City Council to drive uh, disabled people around to fill the council statutory duties and he did his job superbly, uh, he came to contact with people who were disabled and were often ethnic minorities and then in, I think it was 2010, uh, a list was published on the internet of BNP party members and his name was on the list and he was set by Bradford City Council solely on the grounds that he was a member of the BNP now, there'd never been a complaint about his conduct. There'd never been a complaint about how he handled or treated people different from himself. He held a private view, which never translated into his work, but nonetheless, he was fired for it. He went through every single court in the UK, he got nowhere, and he eventually went to the European Court of Human Rights and won on the grounds that our laws had failed to protect his rights to freedom of speech and freedom of association. Now, this is where I have to pick something that uh, Seasway set up, that platforms and speech are not the same thing as freedoms. They're not, they're different, but the freedom of association, and thereby the freedom to disseminate your views, is a protected right under law, under the European Convention of Human Rights, under the UN Declaration of Universal Rights, just as is freedom of speech. And you can't pretend that no platforming pertains only to issues of speech. It affects other rights as well, which people, people hold just as freely and just as much entitlement to exercise as freedom of speech. Now, Arthur Redfern won in the European Court of Human Rights, and the court delivered the following verdict, which I would ask the opposition to reflect upon, that the rights of freedom of speech and freedom of association are applicable not only to persons or associations whose views are favorably received or regarded as inoffensive or as a matter of indifference, but also to those whose views offend, shock, or disturb. Now, it's true to say that a lot of free speech commits harm. A lot of it offends, shocks, and disturbs. But those of themselves are not very good reasons to censor or to tell others who they can and cannot actually hear the views of. 
Now, I don't quite agree with Chi Chi's point that um, giving somebody a platform is a form of legitimizing. I'll be very quick. You may recall a couple of years ago, in 2009, the United Kingdom elected for its first time ever fascists to parliamentary office when it elected two members of the BNP to the European Parliament. Nick Griffin was shortly thereafter invited onto the BBC's question time, and it had precisely the opposite effect as that one that Chi Chi postulates. It completely undermined his credibility. He was revealed as a lunatic Holocaust denier. The BNP has completely fallen apart since. It gathered a total of about 2,000 votes in the last general election. The effect of providing somebody with a platform is not for them just to disseminate their views, but for those present to question them. And it's the process of questioning which determines legitimate views from illegitimate ones. And that's the thing that I think ought to be protected. 